I would like to welcome our in-person audience and virtual audience to track for translating data into actionable insights. Our session this hour is data lineage in the metaverse. Everyday companies like yours struggle but strive to find insights from data so you can grow the revenue, you can retain your customers, and you can manage your operational risks. And in order to do that, you're constantly collecting, curating, stewarding, and managing your data. But to make informed decisions, you need to fully understand the data. And this is where data lineage comes into play. Data lineage provides insight into your data flows, but in a large organization with many different systems, this can be a complex and challenging thing to do. And this is where our speaker today, Arka Mukherjee, will discuss the future view into data lineage and how do you go from two-dimensional screens of visualizing data lineage into three-dimensional landscapes like the metaverse to visualize and display the data lineage. Arka, floor is yours. Thank you. It's the end of the day, so um, I'll start by thanking all of you for showing up. Uh, that's hard enough, but uh, um, so I've been doing this talk on data lineage at this conference for the last four years. Every time I give some variation of data lineage and why it's more significant, uh, it's increasing in, in significance. So this year I thought that uh, we'll talk about uh, the, the change that's happening in the market related to dynamic data. Right. For the last 10, 20 years, we've been really focusing on static data environments where we're looking at primarily at data that's at rest. But uh, as we get more sophisticated in our understanding of data, therefore, uh, we start moving into problems that are related to the dynamic nature of data. Right? And so data lineage is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to looking at dynamic data. And that... Uh, because the sophisticated problems are now moving into uh, what happens when data changes, what happens when data moves, what happens when data evolves, right? Uh, so these are, this is a new class of, uh, of uh, uh, problems that I think uh, yeah, we are just beginning to jump into. Well, let me check my clicker. Okay, let's skip this. Uh, so just... Uh, a couple of quick words about Global IDs. Uh, uh, I started the company about 20 <laughs> years back. I left IBM, sold all my stock, and then uh, decided to give this a shot. And uh, somehow I'm still on my standing on my feet. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we sort of get uh, interesting, uh, we look at interesting problems in data, you know, uh, and so, uh, we've been uh, experimenting with what is the uh, what is the future of data, and most of our, our focus is we yeah, we have to make money in order to uh, keep uh, keep the organization going. But uh, we are primarily interested in solving hard problems, uh, which other people don't want to tackle. And uh, lately, you know, what we've been doing are these what we call intersection problems. So. As you go through the conference, you come across a whole bunch of pe people working on a whole bunch of problems. Um, and what we are saying is that uh, how do we innovate and how do we sit on this data platform and create new value for our organization? So uh, our innovations are in four or five areas. Um, so, and it's really a Venn diagram. So there's data and a Venn diagram of a new um, emergent force in the market. Right? So we take the Venn diagram and say, what's the intersecting area and what's the value, uh, of new value that can be created in the market? And so we've been experimenting with things like quantum computing. So you may have heard of quantum computing and the fact that it's going to change the world. Well, how does data and quantum computing create new value? Right? So that's one of the problems we're working with. The other one is, uh, what does the blockchain do in order to... Um, you know, in order to take data and use the d distributed le ledgers to automate computing. So Web 3.0, blockchains is another innovation area. The metaverse is, of course, you know, the one that we're going to talk about today is also a very interesting area because it is possible that in the future, you know, all these 2D environments that we use as computer screens, you know, will go away and that we will be fully in a, in a, yeah, in a, in a, 
uh, in an environment that uh, is uh, either augmented reality or virtual reality and that we are all in the middle of all that. So early experimentation in terms of what the intersection of data and the metaverse is, is what you're going to see over here. Hopefully you'll find it interesting and something to uh, you know, just say, okay, I learned something new today. So, um, so data lineage, just uh, so essentially what I'll do is I'll do 10 minutes in terms of a, a quick introduction into data lineage. Most of you don't really need an introduction, but I'll just uh, I'll cover the, some of the nuances that you might find interesting. And then in the second part, I'll take 10 minutes and show you what we've been creating in the metaverse. And then uh, any questions that you might have, we'll spend the last five minutes. So that's our plan. Uh, so starting with uh, uh, lineage, what is lineage? It's the flow of information across a, a data ecosystem. So you have a table one in one system, then you have a table two in the second system, and a table three in the third system. And you want to understand how data is flowing across these systems, right? So uh, there's an, from the origination system to an intermediate system to a destination system. This is how data is flowing. And you, know, you have a picture like this. And OK, that's telling you what data lineage is. So that's really at a high level what data lineage is. Data is moving from one environment to intermediate environments to uh, destination environments. So why is this important? Well, the regulators are essentially saying that all the reports that you create from your downstream uh, um, environment cannot be trusted. We don't know whether you cooked it up uh, or you know, whether uh, you know, it, it happened by mistake, but we don't trust you, right? And so where did this, all this data come from? Uh, problem is that the moment you ask that question, where did this data come from, people are scratching their heads and saying, uh, I can't figure, out, figure this out because I have this very complex data ecosystem from which the data is coming and there's no way of tracing all this. Right? So it's a big, it's a giant problem and uh, our answers to it so far have been drawing pictures. You know, people go in and they interview some people and then they say, okay, I'm going to draw you a picture of how this data came. But all our, our attempts at taking those drawn pictures and saying, is this real? Show that most of it is just BS. Right? You actually have to have to compute it out of the data landscape in order to have real data lineage and solve real problems that are of some value. So the regulators are demanding exactly that. Right? So uh, so uh, so she's uh, from the uh, you know from the federal go government, and so for them it is really important to have trustworthy information coming from the. Uh, co coming from um, uh, all the companies that run our economy. And so they, the regulatory demands are sig significant. Another use case is operational forensics. So if you, yeah, something goes wrong, how do you know where, it, where the problem originated? And so, uh, so in order to find out and trace the problem, you can go into forensics. And then, yeah, if uh, impact analysis is sort of another variant of that, you know, if you're shutting down some system, what if, uh, you know, what other systems are going to be affected, right, if you shut down the system? So these are primarily the reasons why it's important. And uh, so we are, we are sort of going, diving a little bit into lineage, you know, so we are saying that, well, you can start by accumulating knowledge and understanding how uh, uh, this knowledge leads to uh, understanding of the flow of the system. Or you can be a little bit more rigorous, and you can see if there's some evidence to support uh, this uh, data lineage diagrams that you've created. Uh, we are in the camp that says either produce proof or go home, right? So, so uh, yeah, because unless you actually uh, ensure that it's really happening in the data ecosystem, you know, it's really not uh, of uh, much uh, value. So. Um, uh, the problem, why is it a hard problem? It's, the, it's a large scale, complex. You know, the, most of the data that organizations have is fairly disorganized. So, so, uh, so the way we are approaching this is to say that, well, you, know, we, you have to organize your data in a systematic process. And once you have it organized, then you can solve uh, problems like lineage, tracing, uh, quality, and analytics. But if you don't have that foundational layer of discovery, profiling, classification, and mapping done, you really can't solve any of these uh, hard problems, right? 
So, uh, so the idea there is that we would recommend, like most of the vendors, uh, you know, in the, in the conference, say they, you know, build a foundation where you understand your data. And what understanding means is those four problems. So, uh, so we're going to f uh, just uh, go a little bit deeper, and so please bear with me while I talk about these three things. Uh, where we start with saying, you know, when you look at lineage, uh, you can look at it through those uh, three lenses of knowledge, evidence, and proof. The, uh, and you can look at it by either looking at metadata that's flowing, or you can look at data that's flowing. So the first is sort of the top part is how do the columns flow, you know, and, uh, and then how do the records actually flow. The real problem, of course, is in data tracing. You actually want to see not what one table is moving as it's moving across the landscape. You want to see this particular record originated from this system, and then where did that record go as it went down the ecosystem? That's a much harder problem than data lineage. We are calling it data tracing, but you can't solve that without, uh, without the data trace. So, so be, again, please bear with me. I'm going through a fairly complicated chart, but I'm showing a. I'm going to show you a seven-step uh, systematic approach towards solving uh, this problem. The first thing uh, is that attestation part and manually mapping what data is moving from where to there, and this is where most organizations start off with. They call their system subject matter experts and they say, uh, "Tell me you know, where your customer data went from this system to that system." and uh, you collect all that information, and then you say you draw your Visio diagram. Right? That's the basis. If you're smart, smarter, you do what Amantor does. Amantor is one of the data lineage companies. We, uh, uh, yeah, they are in the space where they uh, they scan the code, they scan the code associated with systems, and then they say, okay, this is how data flows. Problem with both these approaches is subject matter experts are rare, and code is not available. So you can't really do it at, at a large scale. Right, so so the uh, the approach that we use is to say, go and scan the whole ecosystem. Right, yes, there are automated ways of scanning the whole ecosystem. So you scan the whole ecosystem, and you look for commonality and overlap in the data as it's flowing through. So let the computer do the hard work, uh, and essentially, in steps three and four, you're looking at commonality of metadata as it goes from system to system. So if the there are different kinds of metadata, of course. There's physical metadata, logical metadata, semantic metadata that actually is, is flowing through. And if you can somehow, you know, let's say you can understand how that flows, then you have a little bit more evidence and you can trust uh, what is coming out of here. The proof part where uh, we tend to focus is really in terms of saying, I'll, I'm able to reconcile every uh, environment where data is flowing. So I have a source system, I have tar target system, I have no idea of how the data got from the source to the target, I don't have any ETL code, but I need to make sure that every record that's in the source system landed up in the target system without modification, right? So, uh, so we can look at it from the viewpoint of IDs, we can look at it from the viewpoint of records, this is what I'm going to visualize in a moment. And, and then the problem that we cannot solve, which is the hard problem in the space, is looking at transformed records and uh, aggregated records. That really is a hard problem, right? And so we don't have any large-scale automated ways of doing that, but uh, in those select cases, that we request for code. At that point, you know, if you have code, then we can scan the code and say, this is how aggregation or transformation is happening. So, so, uh, so we, we land up creating a lot of hypotheses about how data is flowing, and you, know, you have these complicated diagrams, and then we prune it down and say, no, this is what's actually happening, and you're left with the true uh, data uh, environment. But the, but the problem that we ran into at uh, the basis of today's conversation is that we are not being able to display this in 2D. Because there's just like, most of these uh, flows are, 20, 30 hops that are happening from origination system. Most, yeah, I, I, I should really qualify that. The complex ones are 20, 30 hops. The simpler ones are maybe four or five hops, right? But uh, we, we are saying that you can't really see this in its totality uh, as, you, um, as you look at lineage. So this now brings me to the 
okay, so what do I do, right? And how do I use innovation that's happening in the market? You know, Facebook has gone meta. And so, yeah, maybe we need to think about uh, some of the solutions. So we, we've been working a couple of years trying to build out, yeah, some, yeah, I would say like things that are just popping in my brain and then I, I tell our developers to build it out. So it's, uh, um, so, so let's take a look at it, right? So, okay, I need to, uh, okay. So uh, can you pause for a moment? Yeah, so what is this environment, right? So, uh, so essentially, you know, uh, I'm a, a fan of the movie, The Matrix. You know, all of you have seen it. Uh, a lot of you may have seen it. So the idea is that, you know, the world is just a construction of data. So we said, all right, developers, give it a shot. You know, build a, a data ecosystem uh, in a three-dimensional space where you actually take each, each of these buildings are actually applications that we have scanned. So you scan the thing, and so every database is a part of the building. You know, every floor is a table, and inside you can go inside the room that the, or the floor that is the table, and then you can look at the whole room and say, okay, this is uh, this is what the data environment. So it's a pure automated process, right? So it says go and scan the ecosystem, and then this thing pops out, right? So so this is sort of one of the innovations uh, that. Uh, We've been doing. I'll just I'll go into data lineage in a moment, but just uh, some ideas uh, coming from all the movies that I see, the science fiction movies I see. But uh, this is sort of how to. Yeah, can you turn, put it on? Yeah, let it move. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. This is like my version of the Matrix. <laughs> so so yeah. So it's like yeah. It's uh, every uh, line of business is a city of this kind, and you know you go around and uh, you have all these cities representing lines of business. Uh, then uh, you know because the environment is very very compli complicated, we find it hard to b build uh, very complex hierarchies. So this is sort of complex hierarchies where you can see all tables and columns at the end of the hierarchy. So another experiment in terms of saying, can we take very, very large complex structures? Because we are typically dealing in, in the large banks that we work with, 100 million columns, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so it, you have to take massive amounts of information and just like in the metri matrix, you know, compress it into things that can be understood. This is, uh, I don't know, can you pause for a moment? Yeah. Uh, have you seen the movie Anon? Has anyone seen the movie called Anon? Yeah, it's a, it's a futuristic uh, movie with uh, Clive Owen and uh, it talks about uh, the world in which uh, you know, you're, you're walking around the room. So I'd come into a room like this, I'd have a, a, a contact lens and I'd be able to sort of look at him and see all the data <laughs> your name and your background and what you do, and so I'm, I'm walking around, uh, 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 walking around uh, augmented reality, just seeing this. And they have this particular uh, structure where, uh, associated with every every person that's walking, there's this rectangular that stores uh, rectangular structure that stores information about that person. So yeah, please turn it on. So. So then uh, you actually, as you're uh, walking through the space, you're going through this. In our case, we've just taken this and uh, said, look at uh, applications. OK, so enough said. Please pause. Yeah. So, uh, so, so those were just a couple of sort of innovations that we've done in terms of saying, ah, this metaverse thing seems pretty interesting. And the scale of data that we are doing is like a deluge. You know, we deal with more metadata than most organizations, you know, 500 million columns, you know, uh, 200,000 databases. Those kinds of environments are very complicated and very hard to understand. And so we need ways of compressing the data, just like uh, they claim to do in the matrix. And so those were my experiments. I thought you'd like it, and so I just wanted. Now let's go into lineage itself. So, so, uh, yeah, so this sort of starts off in the 3D metaverse space, saying, you know, here are all the lineage models that have been generated in 2D. They have been created. Now we can turn it on. And so it says, let's go into uh, the flow, and here are all the flow models that have been created. 
goes first to the Federal Reserve 2052A uh, liquidity report is one of the uh, requirements from the banks, uh, requirements from the regulators against any large bank, you know, any significant financial institution in the country, you know, uh, uh, that is that Federal Reserve uh, liquidity report is, uh, is there. So this is just a, a mock-up of the uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, uh, so it's not moving for some reason. Is it is it on? It's playing. Yeah. Okay. So it's maybe paused in the uh, flow itself. Let's let's let let it move a little bit. Okay. So once again, I've laid it out in, in 3D space. This is how the 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 product tables are moving, and I want uh, so this this would be the equivalent of my Visio diagram, but now it gets a little bit more interesting, right? So now I want to drill down into those products and say, okay, what are the columns uh, in that particular table? and say, okay, I'm going to click on the product ID column, and it's going to show me all the values or some sample set of values in the product ID column that shows up. And then uh, I can pick a particular value and say, show me that record related to that product ID, right? So because I want to actually look at this at a record level, I'm not really interested in the uh, high-level metadata lineage. I'm actually interested in looking at what is the record that's flowing, because I want to eventually reconcile yeah, this whole environment. So can you pause there for a moment, please? Uh, appreciate it. Uh, so, so now I have actually looked at the record. So that particular record is saying, here's the column that I have, and those are the values. So yeah, so I have product ID is a certain value, subproduct is a certain value, client ID is a certain value. So I have the entire record, but it's a single record in that, uh, in that product details table uh, that you see in the middle. So, uh, I know what I'm looking for. You know, someone's told me that this is this particular record that I'm interested in because there might be some problem in it. And tell me where this came from and tell me where this is going to, right? And I can also do a search you know, for any, you know, any of these search values and search for it as well. But once I have done this, I have visibility at the record level of everything that's moving across the landscape. So let's, uh, yeah, let's move it. So, uh, so, so at this point, um, and uh, at this point, now I, I wasn't sure how to do this video because you know, if there's too much movement, it, like our brains, uh, so I ask them to pause in the middle. So you'll have to bear with me, uh, as uh, uh, yeah. So okay. So so now what's happening is okay. I can go into the source system behind that data. And then I can go into the target system behind that data and say this is how this particular record is sort of moving uh, across the data landscape. So, so now just uh, we'll we'll have to pause there for a moment and uh, just uh, just understand the implication of this. Essentially, what I'm saying is every record that you have in the data landscape, you know, is now sort of we know how it's flowing across the ecosystem. You've done it by at automation, and you've done it at scale, right? So now you can reconcile all the essential the errors that that come out out of uh, you know, just this is data quality in its most useful form. It's not general purpose data quality, but it's actually saying that as this record moves in, uh, you know, here's uh, potentially what is happening to that record. So let me move to that use case. Let's turn it on. Yeah. So. No, so now you'll notice that I'll, I'll do a search and I'll go into a different record where there's changes in values that have happened. So uh, with the, when it comes to the, the, the point where it actually goes out and do, does a search, it says, I'm not really interested in this particular record, but I, I'm interested in a different record. So, um, so you click on that and says, okay, yeah, what's, what's the value that you're looking for? Now, this is the part that's hard on a metaverse environment, typing stuff. It's not very, <laughs> it's not very easy to uh, yeah, type, the, use the, the Oculus uh, keyboard you know, to do all this. But anyway, you can do it in, in two dimensions as well. Uh, so, so now it goes and finds me a different record. And you may notice that there are certain values there in red. Uh, you can't really see them very well, but like, you can see that those values have changed as they have moved, right? So, so, so now I know exactly where an error has been introduced, either intentionally or unintentionally, whatever, 
for some reason as the data is, is flowing uh, across the environment. And so, uh, so now I have like the, the kind of visibility that we've always, always been dreaming about, right? The record level visibility, uh, reconcilable re record level visibility as it uh, moves into the environment. So, so that's really the essence of uh, the presentation. Uh, yeah, this, yeah, I think this or uh, versions of this created by other vendors, you know, will become more, much more prominent in the space in the next uh, five years. But this is our, our uh, way. The last part, I show how you can drill down from the 3D environment into the 2D environment and, you know, and explore other aspects in the, uh, in the 2D environment. So yeah, so that's a uh, 2052A liquidity report uh, as modeled from one of our customer environments. So OK, so I'll go back to the presentation in the last two minutes. Uh, let me just go into the conclusion. And so what we're seeing is the data universe continues to get larger and more complex at a rapid space. You know, we've uh, heard a, a number of uh, our presenters sort of talk about uh, you know, the breadth and complexity that's going up. So we, we want to address the complexity problem, right? And uh, uh, so what we are saying is without understanding the dynamic aspects of the data landscape, it's uh, hard to understand uh, complexity. Visualization is limited in 2D and yeah, the interactive immersive experience might be uh, something uh, that uh, is going to be the default in the, uh, so, if innovation in these areas, you know, whether it's quantum computing, whether it's uh, metaverse or blockchains or other things, yeah, uh, we'd love to sort of talk to you about it. But uh, yeah, with that said, yeah, any questions either from the audience uh, or the remote audience, uh, I'll be happy to answer. I think there are multiple data universes now. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a multiverse there, exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, very fascinating. Um, the, when you suggested the drill down from the 3D to the 2D, is that since you could identify the issue in the 3D and then you can go resolve it in the 2D? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, in t we are used to working in 2D spaces, and so, yeah, we want, we want our customers to be very, in very familiar environments. We want them to step into, out into 3D only when the 2D environment is insufficient, right? So our, our goal is to say, okay, if you're looking at data flowing across 20 tables in the landscape, you can't really make sense out of it in 2D. Time for you to go into the metaverse. So if you switch in and out, um, yeah. Now, I'm a little bit apprehensive about our users going around with big Oculus <laughs> in, their, <laughs> in their office, yeah. but uh, there are, yeah. <laughs> I think they'll play games while they're not. <laughs> it's, it's going to become kind of like a cell phone at some point yeah. where everyone's wearing this. And yeah, uh, but that is happening. I mean, if you look at the miniaturization that's happening, both by Facebook as well as other companies, you can see that that's happening. So it's just a matter of time before our glasses or our contact lenses uh, have this kind of data in it. Right? So, yeah. Perhaps. Yeah, thank you. So, no, thank you. I think I understand the need. There is a need to visualize in 3D. Um, I have two questions. First one is, I know we understand the structured data. As more and more unstructured data is coming up, like documents, research notes, now we have research. How do we scan them automatically? One. And the second one is that most of the time, regulators come to you asking for historical, like, you know, oh, seven months ago, mm -hmm. how was your mm -hmm. view? Mm -hmm. How can we visualize as of that day? I think, you know, like that is another challenge, I think, you know, so I know it can do current, but as of that day, how was the data flowing? What was the product IDs and assets? You, you honed in on the real challenge that banks face. Yeah, that the regulator is not interested in what you're showing right now. It is at a point in time, and the point in time, the master data has changed, and, you know, you don't have bitemporality in your, in your systems, and so it's like, what do I do here, right? Uh, and so that, that is the heart of the problem. So the, the answer to this is, of course, you know, what some of our other speakers have spoken, that you, know, you need to have a state machine that captures the information at past points in time. And so uh, that is currently not available unless you create a knowledge graph in, your limited, uh, in a limited set of data. You can't solve the problem at scale, but maybe you can solve the problem, uh, the state uh, diagram problem. Um, in, 
Okay, yeah, so that, that would be the way to do it, but it's an unsolved problem. We don't know anyone who solved it, I mean, including the big banks after massive amounts of investment. We don't know good solutions. So. Yeah. Any other questions for Arka? Well, thank you. Okay, thanks uh, everyone. Yeah, thank you.